good morning, everybody. It's good to see you this morning. Here's what I want us to do before we get started. I want us to, in just a second, I want us to welcome everybody that is Acacia. So we're going to welcome everybody at our Segan campus. We're going to welcome everybody at our old Hammond campus, everyone watching at the treatment uh, centers that we partner with, people watching online, people that watch on our podcast. So you're ready on the count of three. Let's all welcome everybody because it's good to be in Acacia. One, two, three. Let's make everybody welcome. Good to be here this morning. Now, in case you haven't noticed, I am not Pastor Russ. I don't sound like Pastor Russ. I don't look like Pastor Russ. He'll be back next week, so if this is your first time, don't allow today to prevent you from coming back next week. Come back next week and give him a chance, and I promise you, you will not regret it. It is good to be here, and I'm so thankful to be here. I love this house. I give honor to Pastors Russ and Stephanie. We love them very much, and they are dear, 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 dear influences, friends, mentors in my family's life, and we love them so very much, and and we just love everything that is Acacia. Uh, We really do. I spoke here just about 51 weeks ago, uh, last year in March, and then it still, it, it felt like home. Um, if you don't know me, if you don't know who I am, my wife and I and my two children, Maggie and Ian, we lived here for uh, about three and a half years, and then we transitioned to Oklahoma City uh, back in 2018, I believe it was. That's right, the summer of 2018. And uh, so we spoke here last March, and I was like, man, it just feels like home. And uh, I'm really glad, and I'm honored, and it doesn't really matter if you know me or not. I'm just glad that today it doesn't just feel like home. It is home. Um, and me and my family are coming back home at the end of the school year. And if you don't know me, you're going to have to get used to my ugly face. I'm sorry. You will love my wife and my kids. But we're coming back home, and I'm so happy that we'll get to join back because there's nothing like Acacia Church. Can somebody say amen to that? Amen. So Acacia, it's a, um, it's a non-traditional church, and I'm thankful for that. I grew up in a very traditional church environment. Uh, I grew up Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Tuesday night, peanut brittle. We made peanut brittle because we had to pay for all that electricity we were using uh, for being in church so much. Um, Friday night youth service. And then when I was growing up, we would go into six-week revivals. Today, that means you might have the same person speak over six weekends. For me, when I was growing up, that meant that we were in church six weeks every night. And if if my dad, who was our pastor, was feeling nice, he might let us off on Saturday night, maybe. Uh, so I'm thankful to be a part of a more non-traditional church. I'm glad that I don't have to, to wear a jacket and a tie uh, to speak. If you're wearing one, great. You look good. But for me, I just I don't like wearing ties. I, don't, I, just, I feel like I'm trying to hang myself, and I don't want to do any of that stuff. And so I, I'm thankful for all the different things. I love the lights. I love, I love the programming. I love the technology. Everything about what Acacia is doing is amazing. I'm thankful for that. But at its core, at at who Acacia really is, Acacia still has some pretty traditional things going on. There's some things that that really are traditional. We still place Jesus at the center of everything. We, We still worship responsively. We still practice generosity. We still serve with excellence. We we still honor others and we bring others with us. Acacia Church has some foundational principles and some cultural values that are really traditional. We exist not to bring glory and honor to ourselves. We exist not to make us look better, but we exist to inspire hope for a better life through Jesus Christ. And I'm thankful for those traditions that this non-traditional church is holding on to. It sounds a lot like the early church in the book of Acts. 
And that's the reason why we're kicking off today this series called Ancient Past. If you were here or if you've been around the last several weeks, the hashtag goal series has been phenomenal, hasn't it? I mean, I've, I watched every one of those and, and Pastor Russ made me laugh. He made me cry. He made me feel like I was the best husband in the world. And then he kicked me in the face and made me feel like I was the worst husband in the world. I, did, I just had all the emotions going on. But it was amazing. And now we're going into a new series called Ancient Past. It's a teaching series on the book of Acts. And, and just a little bit of a background about the book of Acts, just a brief introduction. It's written by Luke, uh, who was a physician. Uh, he was not a disciple, but he was a, a follower and admirer of everything that was going on. And he wrote the book of Acts. And he, I love how he starts in Acts chapter 1. He says that he, he introduces it to Theophilus, and he says, I wrote my first book, the Gospel of Luke, uh, to, to show all the things that both Jesus began to do and to teach. And I love how I use the word began because that means that the book of Acts is a continuation of everything that Jesus started. It didn't end, but it continued. And I love that it's about the beginning of the early church. It's the beginning of where the church began to form and revival began to break out all across the land. It's an amazing book, and we're going to spend a few weeks talking about this. The book of Acts, it's often described as the Acts of the Apostles. But really, I think that's a, I think that's a, mis, uh, a misdescribed thing. I think it's really more of this. I think it's the Acts of the Holy Spirit in and through the Apostles. See, we want to be relevant today, and we want to be relatable to everyone, but we don't ever want to forget where we started. Collectively, the church, the body of Christ, began a little over 2,000 years ago in the book of Acts. We don't want to forget how that started. We don't want to forget who they were and what they believed to be important. Just a few years ago, this local house, Acacia Church, began in a living room and then moved to a clubhouse. And now, thank God, so many doors have been opened. And now we're at one church, two locations. We're here. We're at Old Hammond. We're at different places. God has opened doors for us to be. And as this church is growing and as this church is enlarging and as its mission is increasing and reaching more and more people, we don't ever want to forget where we came from and who we are and what's important. Since its beginning, since that first meeting in a living room, I know because I've been around him and I've watched him and I've heard him and, and I've experienced his passion. Pastor Russ has always said that the Holy Spirit would be a massive part of who Acacia is and what Acacia does. This church will always be a spirit-led, spirit-filled, and spirit-driven house. The Spirit will be in front of us, leading us. It will be within us, equipping us. And it will drive us and empower us to see all that God has called us to do as a church and to all that God has called you to do as His follower. So if you didn't already know, if it's new to you, after today and after the rest of the series, you're going to know this, that the Holy Spirit, being an active part of Acacia, will be and will always be an understood given. It's a foundation that may not be mentioned every Sunday. You may not hear the words Holy Spirit every Sunday, but it's a foundation that we will stand on and we will build on with every activity, every ministry, every plan that we put into place, every sermon that is preached, every lesson that is taught. It will be done in and through the power of the Holy Spirit. Somebody say amen to that. And why don't you clap your hands and thank God for what he is doing in Acacia. You see, this has always been God's church. This has always been God's house. It's never belonged to me. It's never belonged to Pastor Russ. It's never belonged to any of you. It's always been and it will forever be a house that belongs to Jesus. What he says matters. What he says goes. What he requires, what he asks, we do. It's his and only his. You see, we were all saved for a purpose. And if you haven't yet given your life to Jesus, there's no better time than now to give your life to Jesus. There's no better time than to say, Lord, 
I want you in my life. I'm sorry for what I've done. I want to live different. I want to follow you. And I want everything you have for me. And when he saves you, and if you have been saved, then you have a purpose. That purpose isn't for you to plan out. It's not for you to design. It's not for you to go out and and draw a blueprint. But you have a purpose that has uniquely positioned you to do what God's anointing has called you to do. Where he leads, I follow. What he requires of me and asks of me, I'm going to give him. It doesn't matter if it makes sense to others. It can make zero sense to any of you. It may sometimes cause my wife to look at me and think, what are you doing? What are you talking about? Why are we? Why are we doing this? Why are we going there? Why are we making these plans? Because for me, I will always do what the Lord asks of me because that is what matters most to me. Acacia Church, you, we can never be a place that is designed simply or solely by human thought or creativity. I love the creativity around this house. I'm jealous of it sometimes, to be honest, because I've got about zero creativity. The joke is I have about one or two good ideas a year, and then I'm told to just shut up and don't say another word. But I love it all. I love everything about it. I love the way the lights move. I love the way the singers sing. I love the way everything is branded. I love every bit of it. I, I, I can't get enough of it. I want to learn more and more about it. But this church can never be solely about just creativity. It can't solely be just about programs or tweaking the systems that we're trying to do. We want to make this really easy for everybody to find Jesus. But if we're going to do that, Acacia Church has to remain being inspired and led by Jesus. So in our quest and our pursuit of being relevant in the 21st century, in our pursuit to be a relevant 21st century church to reach everybody we can, to grow as large as we can, to see as much as we can. There's one thing we can never stop. There's one thing we can never compromise. There's one thing we can never, ever forget, and that is this. Jesus is never irrelevant. Jesus' word tells us that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus is timeless. Jesus is the forever Jesus is the first, the middle, the last. It doesn't matter what generation you find yourself a part of. If you are in your 70s, if you're in your 60s, if you're in your 50s, if you're a teenager, it doesn't matter who you are or what label has been placed on you. Jesus Christ will never be an irrelevant thing in any generation. He will always be the thing that matters the most. We plan We change methods. We're not going to settle for the status quo. We're going to make this thing go. We're going to move this thing forward. And we're going to continue to tweak. And we're going to continue to build. And we're going to continue to strategize and plan. And we're going to continue to do all those things. But while we do those things, we can never forget that Jesus is what we need. Francis Chan said this, that the church becomes irrelevant when it becomes a purely human creation. We cannot substitute our plans and our creativity and our desires and our preferences for what Jesus is calling us and asking us to do. We can't replace us or Him with us. We can't replace Him with systems. We can't replace Him with strategy. We'll do all those things, but in everything that we do, we will never, ever apologize for making sure that Jesus is front and center of everything that is this house. And somebody say amen to that. You see, all of me needs all of him. And all of you, all of your life, Everything in your life, your marriage, your relationships, your work, your children, your health, all of you, all of who you are needs all of who Jesus is and all of what Jesus has to offer. All of Acacia 
every location, every life group, every freedom group, every serve team and serve team member, every ministry needs all of Jesus. And if we're going to have all of Jesus, if you're going to have all of Jesus, if we're going to be led by Him, and we're going to do what we know that God is calling us to do, there's only one way to do it. We've got to embrace and understand that we have to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, I know that we start talking about this Holy Spirit, it kind of, some people, it freaks out a little bit, right? Because when I was growing up, it wasn't the Holy Spirit, it was the Holy Ghost. I know it puts walls up. My wife and I, we had this conversation uh, just, just a few days ago, and I was like, so, Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost. Well, Heather's traditional, and Heather's like, uh-uh, we ain't got time for the Holy Spirit, it is the Holy Ghost. I was like, well, whatever you want. Some people get scared. They get freaked out. They shut down. They get worried. Some people think we're not doing enough. We want more and more and more. Well, Leonard Sweet, he wrote this. He said that the charismatic Pentecostals have simplified and cheapened the Holy Spirit to little more than an emotional experience. That's kind of how I was raised. But then the old line denominations have chosen to keep the Spirit at a safe distance, preventing genuine, unpredictable movement and manifestation. So whatever extreme you choose, the effect is the same, constraining the nature of relationship with the paraclete. Now he uses this word, and maybe it's new for some of you, maybe you haven't heard it, the paraclete. So let me talk to you a little bit about what the paraclete is, because it doesn't matter what side you fall on. You, you may be one of those that you want a, a demonstration of the Holy Spirit. And then some of you may think, if I see any demonstration of anything spirit-related, peace out, I'm done. Whatever side you fall on, we cannot constrain what the paraclete is and what it does for us in our lives. There's an ongoing debate about how to best describe or translate this word paraclete. Some say it's translated as comforter. Some say it better means advocate. The great preacher and theologian Charles Spurgeon said that the paraclete, the word paraclete is so full that it's extremely difficult to convey to you all its meaning. Paraclete, literally translated, signifies called to or called beside another to aid them. This word is found five times in Scripture. And the first one is found in John chapter 14, verse 16. And it's used to introduce... The Holy Spirit. Jesus prays and tells them, or he tells them he's going to pray in John chapter 14, verse 16. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. That word helper, right there, that's paraclete. If you go back and look at what the original translation was, it's paraclete. And I read from the Amplified Version because I love how the Amplified Version just says, you know what, we're not going to debate this. We don't have time to debate different theology. We just want to get out the good news of what this really is. So they go on and say, comforter, advocate, intercessor, counselor, strengthener, standby to be with you forever. Time out. Let's just stop for one second and let's say, we don't have time to argue about theology. There's a world that needs Jesus. We need Jesus. And so wherever you find yourself on this, whatever you feel about the Holy Spirit, let's just lean into what God's Word says. And let's lay all of our preferences aside. And if you want Him to be the comforter, let Him be the comforter. If you want Him to be your advocate, let Him be your advocate. If you want Him to be your intercessor, let Him be your intercessor. But whatever you do, let the Holy Spirit in your life to help change you and help you in your living daily. Second time is found just ten verses later. And again... Just as in every instance, it's, refer- it's referencing the Holy Spirit. John 14, 26. But the, the, helper, the helper, comforter, advocate, intercessor, counselor, strengthener, standby, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things, and he will help you remember everything that I have told. You see, the Holy Spirit is so extensive in meaning that there's not a singular word that we can put in place to exchange for what it really is. 
the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, that is called to me, beside me, to aid me in everything I do. The Holy Spirit is everything and all things I need. I can't live in and for God apart from the power, the work, and the manifestation of the Holy Spirit in my life. Because the Holy Spirit is God Himself tangibly working in my heart, in my mind, so that I can experience God's grace here in earth just as it is in heaven. And just as it did for the early church of Acts, it's going to do the same for today's church. Just as it did for the apostles in the book of Acts, it will do for me and you in 2020 in Baton Rouge or wherever you're located. Paul wrote to the Philippian church, to the church at Philippi in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Today, in this day, in this moment, We can do all things through Christ. Why? Because Jesus Christ has bridged us with an access to the Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit now works in us by giving us gifts, abilities, and promptings. Not just to do ordinary things. Not just to do simple, easy things. But to do great, amazing things. Greater things than you could ever imagine for your life. You can do it because of the Holy Spirit. Someone say amen. Amen. See, God is a great gift giver. There's no one as generous as Jesus is. His blessings, the new life, breakthroughs, forgiveness, they're all greater than any other gift that anyone else has ever given to us. But of all the gifts that God has given to us, there is nothing greater than the gift He gave when He gave Himself. When He came, And walked on this earth. When he became a ransom for your life. When he became the sacrifice for all of us. That while we were still sinners, he loved us. He cared for us. That he would hang on a cross. That he would go through the death, burial, and resurrection. There's no greater gift that Jesus has ever given to us. And then, after this, he doesn't just stop with giving himself. He gives us The Holy Spirit. How many of you are glad that we're not praying or we're not worshiping to a God who doesn't hear you? Isn't it good to know that we're not praying and worshiping and singing to a God who doesn't understand us, who doesn't know where we're at in life? He never requires more of you than He gave of Himself. He is a God of love continually. He is a God that hears us. He is a God that walks with us. He is a God that is for us. He's not against us. He's not a taskmaster trying to make us suffer. How many of you understand and are thankful to know that God didn't just stop with Calvary, but he continued on and gave us the Holy Spirit so that all of us would be able to live a life that's worth living in him. Something to be excited about. I believe Jesus always does what's best for us. You believe Jesus always does what's best for you? It may not make sense. It may not feel like it in the moment. But Jesus always knows what's best for you. You may not feel like it right now. You may be hurting. You may have pain in your body. You may be suffering. You may be going through the worst moment in your life. And you're thinking, where are you at, Jesus? (laughs) What's going on? The disciples felt that way too. Now, this is a teaching series on the book of Acts, so don't forget that. I'm just spending a lot of time on the Gospel of John right now, so just, just bear with me. We're, we'll, we'll get to Acts, and you'll hear a lot about Acts, but I'm, I'm trying to set this up with, with the importance and what Jesus said about the Holy Spirit. So in John chapter 16, scenario begins to unfold that Jesus begins to tell the disciples about things that are fixed to start happening, and none of it's good. Persecution, you're going to be hated. Nobody's going to like you. You're, you're, going to, you're going to have all these things going on. It's going to be a really difficult time. You're going to suffer. You're going to hurt. You're going to lose some relationships. All these things. But Jesus says in John chapter 16, verse 7, I will do what is best for you when all this is going on. That's good. It's exciting. Right now, there's a lot of us that we feel, we feel like, 
Jesus, I just need you to do what's best for me. I need to get out of this situation. I need to get out of where I'm at. I'm tired of the struggles. I'm tired of the the hurt, the pain, all these things that are going on. So you know what Jesus says is best for them? It's not what I would have said. I would have said, Jesus, never leave me. Stay right beside me. Don't ever let me get my eyes off of you. I want to see you every time I get a chance to see you. Don't ever go away from us. All this nonsense you're talking about, about doing these things, about dying and being uh, given your life and sacrifice. I just, let's just stop. Done. That's what I would say. This is what Jesus said. That's why I'm going away. That's what Jesus says. I'm going to leave. I'm going away. That's what's best for you. It doesn't seem logical, but he went on to say, the Holy Spirit cannot come to help you until I leave, but after I am gone, I will send the Spirit to you. The Holy Spirit is so important. The Holy Spirit is so necessary to living in Christ that Jesus himself said, it's best for you that I leave so that the Spirit can come to you. See, the best thing Jesus ever did for you happened at Calvary. But the best thing Jesus ever sent to you was his spirit. See, I can't see the air that I breathe. It's intangible. I can't touch it with my hands, but I know that the air I breathe is there. Because if there was no air here right now, I would be choking. My physical body would be suffering. Your physical body would be suffering. And if we go too long without air... Irreplaceable damage is going to happen in our lives. And just as air is to our physical being, so is the Holy Spirit to our spiritual being. I can't see it. I can't tell you exactly where it's at. But I have faith and I know it's there. And if my spiritual being goes too long without the Holy Spirit in my life, If my spiritual being goes too long without experiencing the Holy Spirit, then my spiritual being is going to suffer damage. And I'm going to be hurt. And I'm going to be weak. And I'm not going to be able to be the overcomer that I have been promised that I will be. Going back to Leonard Sweet, he said that our greatest asset is invisible and intangible. The paraclete goes out into life's conflict with us and protects us, not only our backs, but also our sides, our fronts, our insides, the whole being. I need the Holy Spirit. You need the Holy Spirit. We don't need to close off. We need to open up to it. Maybe this is the first time you've ever heard anybody talk about the Holy Spirit. When I grew up and how I was raised, it was all about a demonstration of the Holy Spirit. I want more demonstrations of God's Spirit in my life. I want more of demonstrations of God's Spirit in our midst. But more so than that, I want us to understand the benefits of living with the Holy Spirit. It's not just an emotional response to something that's happening in a church service, but it is a practical daily lifestyle. It is a daily principle that I can have in me Before me, beside me, above me, below me, in me, working on my behalf. There's five benefits I want to bring to your attention of the Holy Spirit. First of all, it brings you supernatural power. How many of you ever feel weak? You feel like you can't take another step? You ever getting up out of bed and just like, I'm done? I I can't face it. I I can't go through this. I'm, I'm tapping out. Tap out. I'm done. I don't, have, I don't have an ounce of energy left. We've all been there. But you know what we don't do? We don't quit. We don't give up. We call to remembrance that the Holy Spirit is there for us. Because Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Your relationship might be weak right now. Your body might be physically weak right now. You may be going through some things that nobody knows about or nobody understands. What you don't need to do is give up and quit. What you do need to do is say, yes, Lord, I want your spirit in my life. I want to experience everything about 
your spirit. Second thing it does is it brings confidence into our lives. We don't need more suicidal thoughts because we feel like that we can't measure up. We, we don't need more doing anything we can do to seek validation from somebody else. I don't need to live my life trying to win your approval or trying to have you tell me I'm doing a good job. We all deal with insecurities. We all deal with moments of, I, I just don't, I don't look as good as they do. My voice isn't as good as they are. Those poor people are going to watch a podcast later this week and they're going to be expecting to see Pastor Russ and they're going to see this. And they're going to shut that sucker off and be like, reset, reset, reset. Because we, we judge ourselves. Nobody does a better job at judging us than we do ourselves. Because you know every bit of your failures and your mistakes. But we don't need more turning to drugs and alcohol and all those other things to cope with our insecurities just to try to get by. We need the Holy Spirit. We need to understand what the Holy Spirit does for us. In Acts 4, there was a lot of fear. There was a lot of, a lot of worry. There was what is going to happen, what's going to go on. We don't have any money. We don't know what we're going to do next. We don't know what's going to take place next. We're being threatened to be put in prison. We're, our lives are being threatened. What is going on? The Bible says in Acts chapter 4, verse 31, that after they prayed, the place they were meeting was shaken. Now, if this place starts shaking today, I'm going to be just like you, and I'm running out those doors. Wherever you're at, if, if where you're at starts shaking, I mean, that's between you and God, you, but I'm out. But the Bible says here that where they were meeting, it was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and look what happened. They began to speak boldly. If you need some confidence, you don't need the validation of friends. You don't need the validation of a relation. You don't need to keep fighting for a relationship that's abusing you, that's mentally torturing you, that's hurting you and harming you. What you need is confidence that only comes through the Holy Spirit. It also brings humility. We, we all need a good dose of humility. We don't need to be arrogant. We need to be confident, but we need to understand that what we have and who we are comes from Jesus Christ. We don't need to hoard things. We need to be generous. We don't need to keep it all for ourselves. We need to be willing to go out and help others. And we need to understand that everything that we have, we didn't get on our own. But we got it because of Jesus. And the next verse of Acts chapter 4, verse 32, after they were filled with the Holy Spirit, after they began to speak the Word of God boldly, they didn't get arrogant. They didn't get... Uh, all haughty and all look at us, look at who we are. But the Bible says that they were all united in heart and mind and they felt that what they owned was not their own, so they shared everything they had. They had humility. They got down on people's level. They were okay with getting dirty. They, they were okay with going out and reaching others that nobody else wanted to have anything to do with. They were okay with reaching people that had been considered outcasts and rejects because they had a sense of humility. Look what God's done for me. And the Holy Spirit was leading them. Another benefit is revelation. The Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Truth. And Paul says to the Corinthian church, but it was to us that God revealed these things. How? By His Spirit. For His Spirit searches everything and shows us God's deep secrets. If you want to know what step you need to take next, if you're trying to figure out, should you pursue this promotion? Should, should I go after this job? Should, should I pursue this relationship? Should I make this decision? And you can't get clarity and you're confused and there's just like this sense of, I just don't know. I'm just, I, I can't, I can't, I'm stuck. I'm paralyzed. I can't make any move. Can I tell you, you need the Holy Spirit. It'll bring revelation to your life. And finally, there's a lot of benefits, but just for time, the, the hope of heaven is another benefit that the Holy Spirit brings. Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus 
And now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit, whom he promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give you the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased you to be his own people. He did this so you would praise and glorify him. If you want a guarantee of eternal life, you need the Holy Spirit. If you want hope in a hopeless situation, you need the Holy Spirit. If you want help in a helpless situation, you need the Holy Spirit. As I come to a close, don't forget they were terrified. They were running for their lives. Then Jesus reappeared to them and told them, go wait in Jerusalem. And So after the death, burial, resurrection, after Jesus appeared to them and he ascended to heaven, they went. And there was about 120 people gathered in that upstairs prayer room. They were still terrified. They were still confused. They were still uncertain about their next step because Jesus was no longer beside them and they couldn't ask him to help anymore. We can't forget that while Jesus was walking on earth, they struggled greatly. They couldn't catch fish until he got in the boat with them. They couldn't heal a sick boy until he came down from a mountain and heal the boy until, with, with him being there. And they couldn't ride out a storm in the ship until they went and woke him. But every time they failed, every time they were discouraged, Jesus would always physically show up. Now, he's gone. But when it happened, oh, did it ever happen? Acts chapter 2, verse 4, the Bible says, Everyone in that upper room that was there waiting, paralyzed with fear, worried, confused, were filled with the Holy Ghost and began speaking in other tongues. The Holy Spirit gave them this ability. And from that moment forward, they weren't perfect. They had issues. They bickered. They had times of having no money. But they always had the Holy Spirit. And they didn't stop. And from the moment of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit when it happened until today, God's church has never stopped. The Holy Spirit is the reason we have overcome every every age of persecution, every government that's tried to stop it, every kingdom that's tried to come against it. Nothing has ever stopped God's church. Not because of our talent, not because of our ability, but it's because of one reason, the Holy Spirit and the power that comes with it. And this ancient path of the Holy Spirit forever changed the early church. And it still changes this church today.